Hey guys, it's Matt. If you're driving or just listening, you don't need to see this. Just 10 to 15 images from the 1973 Charlton Heston movie, Soylent Green. And here's the movie poster. And I've seen this for the second time recently and definitely need to cover it again for a variety of different reasons. First off, it's set in the year, as it says here, 2022. <laughs> they got the timing a bit wrong. Um, somebody's saying, surely the city of New York and as the world is depicted in soil and green couldn't be worse than it is now. Oh yeah, it's a lot worse. They always get the timing wrong in these dystopian movies, which tells me they would like the world to look like this by now. So they're in their back room, they grumble that they got the timing wrong, and people are, are actually still able to go to the food store and with whatever little money they have left buy food. They, they, they want it to look like this. Maybe they don't quite want it to look like the movie The Road, but they always get the timing wrong. They're probably quite upset when Jared comes in to serve his pigs and blankets. The other reason is the green, of course. Um, Soylent green, the exact, here we go again, the exact shade of the emerald green. I'm not going to talk about the emerald green color much while covering this movie, but we definitely need to talk about it again pretty soon because it's, it's evolving. The emerald green can be very negative and it can be very positive at the same time. It's the way they want to warp it or the way they want to take it, like the way they, they operate regarding most things. So just real quick, if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, 30 seconds, we've looked at why this emerald green color pops up over and over again throughout all forms of art and media. And look, I, it's the highest evolution of my theory. Is it right? Who knows? But it is confirmed by a lot of smart people who comment and email me, etc. In some way, it represents the illusion of this reality. Uh, and also related to the color that's represented, the, the heart chakra. But what we need to talk about in the future is, is it the hijacked portion of the illusion, the Elon Musk portion of the illusion, which goes off in one direction, or is it the road less taken <laughs> or the path less chosen? Is it the emerald green that's more of a beautiful thing, a natural thing, realizing this world is an illusion, and then that's fine, using it to better yourself. To me, the natural world here is an illusion of some kind represented by the good side of the emerald green, the Glenda the Good Witch of the emerald green. But what color is the bad witch? The same color, the Wicked Witch of the West. So it can be both. There's the creeps come in as usual and hijack and try to taint and soil, <laughs> soil and green. They'll soil their shorts as to what was once good. They hijack it and kind of present their version of the emerald green, which is just a adulterated, stinky mess. But I got, guys, this is going into a whole different video. <laughs> and we'll just, let's just talk about the damn movie. Okay, for those that haven't seen this forever, or maybe have never seen it, let me do three or four minutes uh, recap of what the movie itself is about, plot, uh, Charlton Heston's role, and, and the ending. Somebody's like, Matt, you Matt, you gonna have spoilers? You, where's a good place for happy hour? You, yeah, I'm gonna have spoilers. I, I need to be able to discuss every aspect of the movie, especially the last scene. Spoilers? That's not possible in a movie from 1973. Where you been? You had like 70 years to see this. Get your head out your ass. The movie came out on April 19th, 1973, 97 minutes long. Box office, 3.6 million. And it says rentals. I don't know what's being presented there. It couldn't have done any less than 3.6 million in the box office, right? With Charlton Heston coming off Moses. But guys, it doesn't matter. I don't trust, I don't trust the box office number as it's presented in Wikipedia for any movie. I haven't for years. And now, especially, what, four videos back... The box office number for Austin Powers Gold member was the exact support floor price for gold. Not well, according to Rob, it was pretty much pretty much the exact floor price for gold before gold's almost almost twenty year run up to two thousand. So I didn't trust the box office number as it's presented in Wikipedia before the Austin Powers Gold member video, and even this. In terms of what's being presented in the movie, Soylent Green, complete dystopian society, 
A human life has no value. People begging their government masters for food. Like on certain days, they have Soylent Red. We get little red chips and Soylent Blue and blue chips. And I guess the special day is when they get Soylent Green. Is that on a Tuesday? Wouldn't surprise me if they gave that out on a Tuesday. I forget. But of course, the 3.6 in the box office, three sixes. It's the 666. That's what they're presenting to me. From, from my perspective, that's what these creeps are presenting in this box office number. I don't think 666 usually means Satan or Lucifer. I think there's a lot of different meanings. It's more about, to me, it's more about the, 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 the 666, six carbon, carbon six, six electrons, protons, neutrons represents the human being, the devolution, if that's a word, it's my word, of the human being. Um, the materialism attaching to the material plane, associating yourself with everything here instead of uh, grasping your spiritual side. That's what the 666 means, moving away from the spiritual towards the physical. And maybe that is what Satan is, but that's for another, uh, you know, we'll talk about that some other time. So if anybody stumbled upon this video and you go, wait a second, you, th you don't think the movie really made $3.6 million. You think that it's a representation of 666, three sixes. Of course, that's what I think. If you stumbled upon this video, what you doing here? Go back to your cat video. If you think me saying 3.6 million at the box office is code for 666, and that's the most insane thing you've ever heard, you have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding how this reality works. I might be wrong about this. Of course, I might be wrong. But if you think that's nuts, you have a lot of work to do. There's a lot more to life than Sally, Jesse, Raphael. A little bit more about the movie, just to refresh your memory if it's been a long time, or some of you maybe haven't seen it. Charlton Heston here, in this middle of this crowd, this mob, is with the football helmet type thing on. He's a police officer doing riot or crowd control. And this is probably the day when their government masters offer up the Soylent Green, and people like, you know, crowd in the streets and beg their government masters for the soil and green. There's no real food in this society. There ain't no, uh, other than with the super rich, we'll talk about that later. There are no chicken wings, there's no heads of lettuce, there's no apples. The government and their government masters give out Soylent Green, I think, on a Tuesday, I think. But the Soylent Corporation gives out these wafers. It's all wafers, like the green ones on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, they get Soylent Red, or they get Soylent Blue on a different day, I think. It's something like that. There's no real food. They get these wafers that keeps them alive, sustains them. Isn't it kind of like what they gave out? What they give out at the in the movie Snowpiercer? Didn't they give out these little, like... It looks like a jello square, but it was just a protein block of some kind. There's no real food, but people still want and covet this soil and green because it supposedly comes from the plankton and the algaes of the oceans. The nutritional value of soil and green is much higher than the other shit-ass wafers that their government masters give out to them. And I guess people start to push and shove, and then they have to bring in these things called the scoops. Bring in, they're bringing in the scoops. This It's like trash trucks with a big backo, I don't know, loading arm that digs earth, but they scoop the people up. It's kind of like New, what New York City does to the trash trucks when, the, when it snows 10 inches. They put a plow and they send all the trash trucks out to help plow. They put this scoop and they scoop up the people. So people, when the soil and green is offered, you know, the, the crowds really get unruly. But as the movie plays out, um, Charlton Heston's roommate is, his name is Saul. It's Edward, I didn't realize this the first time I saw it, Edward G. Robinson from the Ten Commandments. It's Damon. It's Damon, the slave master from uh, the Ten Commandments. He discovers that the oceans are dying, the same themes they've been scaring the truth community with now for 15 years. All the plankton, there is no algae. So where is this Soylent Green coming from if the oceans are now dead? Well, the story remains that it's plankton and it's coming from the oceans. But as Charlton Heston investigates, well, all these dead bodies that are produced via all these different parts of society, including the, the suicide or the euthanasia center, we'll look at that in a moment, the bodies go to the Soylent, yes, yeah, spoiler, but come on, man, where you been? The bodies go to the Soylent Corporation, and the dead bodies are turned into Soylent Green. The wafers are actually bodies. The wafers are some form of cannibalism. 
And I guess in 1973, this was a big deal. Like how, you know, the, the theme of my goodness, soil and green is people. He screams out at the end. They're, they're taking the bodies off to these centers and producing these protein wafers and people are eating their own neighbor. That, I don't think this phases us anymore because this is exactly what we would expect from McDonald's and Wendy's. And when you go to get burgers like that, what you expect it to be, you think, you think that's a real cow? Have you ever had the Impossible Burger? They love to play games with their English language, their word magic. What does impossible burger mean? Yeah, they sold it to the vegetarians. Oh, it's not meat. And it's, it's, but what are they really saying? Those that understand how these sick sons of bitches do business, what are they really saying with the impossible burger? You have to think along the lines of the, using the, the word impossible as your center, something along the lines, it's impossible that there's anything in this bun that's not a carcinogen. Or you might say, it's impossible that there's anything in this bun that's not bad for you. Or take it as far as you want. It's impossible that there's something on the sesame seed bun that's not a human calf or thigh. I mean, you have to think the way they think. You, when, when, when they isolate words like impossible in order to understand what's on the sesame seed bun at McDonald's or McDowell's, you got to understand the way they do business. Do I really think the Impossible Burger is somebody's ass cheek? No, but I'm telling you, it is. We've talked about this before. People that are real spiritually sensitive have been knocked on their ass by eating an Impossible Burger. It is sinister, but we'll talk about that some other time. Okay, this is one of my favorite themes presented in Soylent Green, and it'll take a few minutes for me to describe or my personal take on it. But Charlton Heston in this horrible dystopia is a police officer. So he lives better than most, but he's still living in squalor. Right outside his door are like 30 people living in the hallway. I mean, it's that bad. He lives, he's a police officer. He lives with, I believe, an ex-police officer who's uh, Edward G. Robinson. It's Moses and Damon back together again, but they live together. He's become a researcher. Okay, Damon, uh, sorry, Saul, the guy on the right, he finds out that the oceans are now dead and the soil and green must be coming from somewhere else. But they have nothing, and these are supposed to be a higher level, quote, employee of the city. So during an investigation, um, of course, you have the same as usual. You have the super rich class that has everything, has access to everything. And then there is no middle class anymore. Everyone else is pretty much living in varying degrees of complete squalor. So even Charlton Heston, a police officer, he's investigating and he brings home some lettuce, some meat, a couple pieces of four or five day old meat, a half bottle of rum or whiskey, whatever it may be. And th these are like, they haven't had these things for years. And it's incredible to see, they make a big deal out of it. The, he, um, Saul breaks out like he has this relic, it's silverware. He has a spoon that's metal. I mean, nobody has this stuff. And he breaks it out and they have like one piece of lettuce and a piece of meat and a few sips of whiskey. And this is the greatest thing in the world to these two. And, you know, again, if they're living in squalor, imagine how everybody else is living down the road. All they're d d just surviving. So this theme, this appreciation theme hits home with me. I've always been this way. I've mentioned many times in the past, I go into this Wegmans market, or we have this grocery store called Wegmans, and the first three or four or five aisles is just, I don't know, prepared foods, meats, cheeses, uh, all food ready to go, food from different parts of the world, or buffets, and I mean, just everything you can imagine. And almost every time I go in there, I think the same thing. It has to do with some sort of appreciation. I don't know if it's memories from a a past life or why I do this, but I'm sure many of you do this. But I, I think, what would somebody from 1600 or 1850 think about about the whole store, let alone the first three or four rows of just foods and everything prepared, ready to go? And then I start thinking about the waste. How much of this are, gonna, are they going to throw out at the end of the night? Then I think about half of the continent of Africa, probably half. You could tell them about the three or four aisles in this Wegmans, they wouldn't believe you. They wouldn't believe you. Unless, you know, okay, if it's if you're talking to somebody in Nairobi, I'm talking about way out, you know, in the bush of Africa, pretty much half the continent may live like this. Not everybody's in, in a major city, but I don't think they would believe you. 
And for those of you that don't have Wegmans, I'm sure Whole Foods is the same exact way. Of course, It's probably more so in terms of the decadence and the food they have to throw out at the end of the night and things prepared. Almost every food store has to be this way now. The old giant uh, in the Exton Center up here, the gi- it, it, I don't know if it still has it. I haven't been in for a long time. It, ha- it used to have this wing bar, four different types of hot wings. You go in there at 8 o'clock at night and the wing bar would be piled up hundreds and hundreds of chicken wings and you think um i mean just and you, first thing again is the waste well they're not saving that all those wings are going to go I, I guarantee i was going to go bad you know a lot of us i believe I, i'm sure a lot of you would think the same types of things or do as i do when we go into these stores we have a lot in common where i don't know what you call us we're old souls it's our last go around here we are we are seeing we have certain levels of appreciation for this place not that we're in love with this place it's just the opposite but knowing it's your last go around here you come to a certain level of appreciation that knowing it, you're not going to see it again there's something to that i don't it's not coming out properly but i bet a lot of you are understanding what i'm saying where if i were to say the same thing to the guy down the cul-de-sac he I, he doesn't probably think one thing of what I just presented when he goes into his Wegmans or Whole Foods. He probably never thinks about the waste. He doesn't probably think about anybody, how incredible the situation is. It's not coming out right, but you guys you guys know what I mean. This theme, and I think Charlton Heston gets a bar of soap. He, he steals it from a rich, when he investigates this rich guy who died, he was, he's in the rich man's apartment. He brings a bar of soap home. That's a big deal to these two. And I don't know, like, I'm that way naturally, even though the excess still exists down the road. I don't know if that came out right, but I don't think I'm going to change it. This is a picture of the high-rise apartment building of the Soylent Green board member who's murdered here in his own apartment. Uh, This is after the murder. I'll explain who the girls are in a moment. The, The man in the red jacket is the building manager. So this is where Charlton Heston comes to investigate the murder the board member from Soylent Green Corporation is found on the floor. Perhaps he was going to expose that Soylent Green isn't uh, algae and plankton. It's uh, leg and thigh and ass cheeks and people put in these little wafers. So they knock him off. And the girls are all gathered here in the, in the apartment. I forget why. But the girls come with the apartments. So the woman there with her back to us in the blue comes with this apartment. Charlton Heston uh, soon develops... I don't know what you call it, a relationship with her. It's very odd how that plays out. I hope I get a chance to talk about it. But she actually says to Charlton Heston, I hope the new tenant likes me. She comes with the apartment. And they actually call these girls furniture. It's no different than the, it's a furnished apartment, furnished with a couch, a chair, a refrigerator, a microwave, and a beautiful woman. He says, she says, I hope the next tenant likes me. I'm not sure I'm going to have a chance to show you a picture of her, but trust me, she's not going to be kicked off too many magazine covers. I mean, these are beautiful women that come with the apartment. So it's the same themes. You have, again, the super rich and then everybody else living down in squalor. It's very similar to the Justin Timberlake movie, how that's presented. What is it called? About Time, where everybody has a little clock in their wrist. Their, their, their time is their currency, the time they hold which keeps them alive. That's a pretty interesting movie as well, at least the first hour. I think it's pretty stupid. Justin Timberlake, About Time, I think it's called. They stole a lot of the theme of that movie from this movie, but it's the same type of dystopia. Super high class, super rich, and then everybody else. And this is when when he first comes to investigate this place. This is where Charlton Heston finds the, the steak. I mean, hasn't seen a steak in 20 years. Finds some lettuce half a bottle of whiskey and just the girl in the blue is there and you know he he's corrupt but he's less corrupt than everybody else and he's just going to take a few things he actually takes a towel as well and that's a big deal a a new towel a towel that's actually been laundered in this century so i could sense like 10 people firing their rubber duckies off their subway tile walls inside the bathroom you need to see a picture of one of these girls or the girl that came with the apartment this is the one that came with the apartment where the board member of the Soylent Corporation was murdered. 
where Charlton Heston initially comes to investigate. And I guess he just finds or makes up an excuse to keep coming back to continue his investigation, like George Costanza leaving his hat behind as an excuse to come back. I, I can understand that, Charlton. Oh, my goodness. When, when the insurance company in 96 sent me out to Los Angeles, I had two days to find an apartment. And I saw eight places in two days, and I chose the lesser of eight evils. I mean, none of them were that great. It turned out okay. But, you know, I had, I was thrilled because it came with a dishwasher. A dishwasher. That was new to me. This place, (laughs) it comes with her. (laughs) Could you imagine if that place was in East Los Angeles, technically in East Los Angeles, just a mile from the South Pasadena border. If if I didn't read the, the, the fine print, it came with her. Moved in, unpacked my bags, was thrilled to have this dishwasher. Never had a dishwasher before. All the years lived my whole life in this Kingswood Apartments in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Never had a dishwasher. And then sh- I didn't read the fine print. This this woman right here walks around the corner. Like, who are you? This is uh, my apartment. I'm I'm mad. I just moved in here. Don't uh, don't don't take it the wrong way. I'm not I'm not a tenant. I come with the apartment. <laughs> you, you what? You come with the apartment? Do you cook? And she says, does it matter? Not not in any way, miss. Not in any way. Chef Boyardee, Kansas, just fine by me. Guys, this is the fifth time I'm re-recording this. I don't know how to describe this. Let me just tell you what happens here, and then you'll see why I'm struggling with it as we talk about it on the back end. Maybe the second or third time Charlton Heston comes back to investigate the murder that happened in this apartment. There's the woman that comes with the apartment. He just, it's just a given he's going to have sex with her. It's very strange how this scene plays out, and it's very transactional. He goes into the bedroom, she goes into the bedroom, and there is no sense of uncomfortability between the two of them. It's very transactional. They might, as he's getting undressed, he might be talking about the case. Well, we've we've done this, and we're investigating this, and she might be talking about the weather. She's preparing the bed, talking about the weather, and you think, well, Wait a second. They they do have a rapport, a little bit of a rapport, before when he's there. But I don't think he ever kissed her. They don't really have a rapport. But he's now just... I think there's other people. That's when I showed the other people in the living room. He goes into the bedroom. It's just a given he's going to have sex with her. And like if you're, re- if you're writing the script or reading the script or having to create this movie, you think, well, how do you make this believable? It's All I can tell you is it's very believable. Like, because the society is so, it's so degraded and it's so, I don't know, maybe because he's a police officer and he, it's all corruption and he gets whatever he wants, but she's not afraid of him. It's just assumed. And it, that it's very good movie making because it's the weirdest thing in the world. I, I can't even describe it to you properly, but it's believable. When you watch the movie, he's taking his clothes off. She's taking her clothes off and they're talking about the case or just like, oh, do you like the wallpaper? Very, it's just like, it's like a transaction's going to happen. Now, I think they do, um, he's not paying her. She comes with the apartment and he's just pushing his corruption. He's already stolen the soap. He's already stolen the meat. (laughs) And you get the sense this guy's less corrupt than anybody else. He's not paying her, but... Who knows? It's just it, they develop an affection for each other after, which is nice considering what happens. He ends up taking a shower with her, and he hasn't he hasn't been under a real shower in twenty five years or something. So that's one of these other the other kind of appreciation scenes that I think is very interesting. But I don't know if I described that properly. I'm not going to redo it. If you watch the movie, just the transactional nature of and it's just a given he's going to have sex with me. You think, well, why? How does he know? I and mean, she's he's not the tenant there. He's a low life compared to the rich and super rich she's been serving. But somehow this is a very, very well done movie. It's all believable. That is that is um obviously one of the main Tenets, is that the right word, of of good movie making, especially one that's relatively low budget like this. One of the most amazing parts of this movie is how they present these euthanasia centers in the city or suicide centers. I I don't know what you call them. So Saul, his roommate, who is Damon from the Ten Commandments, Edward G. Robinson, for whatever reason, maybe he just can't take the corruption anymore. There's something that sets him off. He goes to one of these massive centers for euthanasia, 
where, and Charlton Heston here, he realizes late that Saul's gone down. He tries to go stop him, but the process has already started. If you're looking at the picture, if you can't see the picture, I'll describe it. You don't need to see it as usual. But you, they give you 20 minutes in this room, lying on a bed. I guess they give you a last meal. They give you some comforts. And you're surrounded in some sort of IMAX screen of all the beauty of nature, running streams and brooks and bees buzzing and birds flying and the rustling of trees and leaves and autumn colors. And it is, for, remember, 19, seeing this in 1973, the way they present this IMAX all around him is, is amazing. It's, you know, I, I don't think Epcot existed, that, you know, you go into some of these rides at Epcot, there's that screen all the way around you. I mean, it's very, very well done how they did this, considering 1973. And anybody that goes in to give up their life into one of these centers is promised 20 minutes of this scenery before, I guess, they inject you lethal injection or something like that. In the city, it, there's so much overcrowding, the resources are so scarce that the city wants people to volunteer for these euthanasia centers. So at first, it's really brilliant movie making because at first, or I'm not sure how many people down the cul-de-sac would see it the way I saw it or the way you might see it. Most times you and I agree and the guy down the cul-de-sac, you know, sailing away on the ship of fools is always going to see things different than the way we see it. But at first, it's kind of presented as a negative. The, is Dick Van Patten uh, runs the center and Charlton Heston uh, wants to come in and save his roommate, but the process has already started. But you don't really, we don't really identify with Charlton Heston as the hero because he does a lot of slimy things. He steals. He's slightly corrupt, not as corrupt as most. He takes advantage of the woman who comes with the apartment to a degree, but then they have a relationship. So then you think, well, is Charlton Heston good or bad? Well, he's overall, by anybody's standards, he's bad, but he's the best of everybody else. So he's good. It's it's very well done because you're not sure if you like Charlton Heston or not. So then the same thing plays out with this scene. I think, does he, does he grab Dick Van Patten and threaten him and say, you're going to get him out of there? And then it's Saul's like, look, the process already started. This is what I want. But if you, I ended up seeing this as a good thing. What's wrong? As a very good thing. You know, the fact that the state today tries to say, you, what more do we control than our own lives, our own bodies and avatars? And the state, the government can tell you what you can do or not do with your own body. I mean, give me a break. This is the greatest. As a, so I thought it would be something bad, and that's, I thought that's what the movie wants me to think. But as time went on, this is the greatest thing in the world. Every state should have a gigantic euthanasia center where if you've just, have, for whatever reason, people are in pain, you can go in and you, they will you know, they cater to your last wishes to one degree or another. I mean, this is only 20 minutes of scenery. It's very transactional because, you know, the state itself is devolved into into just a horrible, you know, Mad Max type of dystopia. They can't spend any more time on those that are dying than the, these 20 minutes. And then as soon as it's done, they clean the room and then bring somebody else in. And then these bodies, of course, the whole point of the movie, these bodies end up becoming the Soylent Green. And one more image of this a massive screen in front of Saul, who maybe at this point he's already been injected and he has 20 minutes or he will be at the end of 20 minutes. A giant screen off to his left, a giant screen off to his right. Incredible scenes of sunlight breaking through clouds, birds, nature. It's incredibly, incredibly well done. And again, the brilliant movie making is at first, you know, you kind of, if you're just watching, the movie, you know, kind of in a zombie state, a certain level of brainwaves, you're kind of thinking, okay, this is a bad thing. But then for anybody that's at all awake, I end up walking away from it saying, this is a great thing. It's not evil. And I think that the movie, when the movie's made, it's trying to cause that sort of conflict in real people. I'm not sure the zombie down the cul-de-sac will, will arrive where we arrive here. But I think I walked away from it saying every state should have a gigantic euthanasia center so if people this is the choice people make for their own bodies they're able to to do it in the most humane way possible so the state as usual the, the government which is a just a big ugly pimple on the nose of the not milk or the screen 
it, c it can never be consistent. It always has to confuse at every single type time it makes a presentation. On one side, they'll give you the Georgia Guidestones. They'll tell you, and Bill Gates will present his formula about carbon. And one of these things has to go to zero in this multi this uh, people times carbon times energy. One of these things has to go towards zero for us to get our carbon standards in, in order. Meaning, you know, on the truth community runs with that. Well, he means people have to go down to the Georgia Guidestones 500,000. So in one sense, they seem like they want the population to go down, way down because of the carbon and all the runaway stuff with um, primate change, an issue with gorillas, primate change. And the other one is called global charming. They, they Oh, that's such a crisis. But the state, the, the quote state, will not, they don't have euthanasia centers. If they're so worried about carbon, why, why wouldn't they facilitate euthanasia instead of making it illegal? Because the, the state is, is a pimple in the nose of the knot milk is first and foremost about confusing what they call a human being. The confusion from their perspective comes first. It, quote, trumps everything else. So what do you mean confusion? Well, okay, present the Georgia Guidestones. Present the carbon uh, equation where one of these things has to go to zero. In their presentation over here, it seems like they want populations to go way down. And then they have truth commuting. Oh, look at Deagle.com, Deagle.com. What the hell is Deagle.com? The, okay, over here, they want, it seems like they want populations to go way down. And Matt, well, the, the fact that they push abortion so, and somehow it's even coming back now in that ridiculous script, or I don't even know what's being presented now. I don't watch the news. It's all part of the same ridiculous recycled script over and over. Sure, with, uh, quote, Roe versus Wade, there's tens of millions of, of deaths on them because of, of that. And on one hand over here, they want the population to go down, but they're never consistent. It's always about confusion. If that's the case, why wouldn't every state have a gigantic euthanasia center for those that choose that for their own body? Why do most states make it illegal to commit suicide? Like that makes any sense. If you successfully commit suicide, we're going to drag the body off the prison or it just doesn't, it's, there's, they're always about confusion. They never can be about consi consistency. They're worried about carbon and, you know, push abortion, push abortion, push abortion, and, you know, push late-term abortion. And as long as the baby's not running out of the hospital, you can still round it up and, and you know, take it out. You know, if you're going to do that, then there should be giant euthanasia centers and there should be no laws at all on any sort of uh, suicide, suicide, assisted suicide. I know it's in some states, but you see how it's never consistent? It's just the way they do business. After spending last moments with Saul at the suicide or assisted suicide or euthanasia center, he follows, if I remember correctly, follows the bodies. And, you know, they're just, I don't know how many people are being killed in this huge center. Maybe one every 30 seconds, something like that. They're loaded on the back of trash trucks, you know, symbolic right there in a lot of different ways. And he follows, or he actually jumps in the back, if I remember correctly, of a trash truck. And fought, where are they taking these bodies? Well, I believe if I remember correctly, I won't give away too, well, I have to give away pretty much everything, but you still should see it. It's still an amazing movie. He, they go, the trash trucks go to the Soylent Corporation, where I guess he breaks into the factory and sees that, these little green wafers, that's somebody's, that's your grandmother or somebody's ass cheek in a, in a little green way. Soylent Green is people. So he calls, he's trying to expose it, calls the corrupted police officers. And, and at the end, I, I, forget, there, I forget what happens. He gets shot or there's some struggle. He's trying to get the word out at the end. I guess he's about to die of a gunshot wound. And there are people around him, maybe the police chief. And he's trying to scream out, you know, that's the famous part of the movie. Soylent Green is people, is your grandmother. He's craw calling it out. And one of the brilliant things about this movie is you just, you just get the sense, of course, nothing's going to change. Nothing, nobody, you know, he's like, get this word out. They're, they're even bringing this thing called the Council of Nations. Like, is that supposed to be a United Nations that have gone undercover? I mean, you know, they're not going to do anything. He tells the other policemen they're corrupt. He's exposed it, but you're just sure at the end it doesn't matter. 
he he's telling a few other people about what they're doing and nothing's going to change you just of course the, the society is beyond repair he could scream it out all he wants and those people that heard him scream it out soil and green is your grandmother just will pretend tomorrow they never heard it and the city will go back and do business just like it always has it's really brilliantly done in that regard So let's close by talking about the reason for these dystopian movies to begin with. Inside the major header of dystopian movie, you have all these sub-genres. You have over here, like I'm showing, the 28 Days Later, and I guess they made a a sequel 28 Weeks Later um, related to some sort of uh, virus or the movie Contagion with Matt Damon playing himself. And then there's Outbreak and all this sort. And then you have complete societal breakdown movies like The Road for whatever natural disaster caused the societal breakdown. Then you have the zombie apocalypse movie, of which this is like a combination of sickness and zombie apocalypse 28 days later. But you have the World War Z and all that stuff going on and Fear the Walking Dead. Then you have the asteroid and the comet uh, type uh, catastrophe movies that lead to a complete breakdown of society. So you have all these subgenres. And if you add up all the movies and TV shows and themes along these lines, what do we have? A thousand different movies and TV show episodes? Or if you add up all The Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead, there's probably thousands. And to me, um, it is because they need real people to help manifest this. Or, or like even Soil and Green. To if people, if real people walk out of Soil and Green in 1973. And there are thousands of conversations between a husband and a wife or two best friends that says, you think the world will really look like that in 2022? And there's the imagination and image that the world potentially could look like this in 2022. I think that sort of manifestation helps them uh, call it quantum, whatever. I don't know exactly how to, uh, to describe it. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they can't do it directly. We know they need us in this regard, and it is the it's not any any you know even I think even a first grade truther at this point would not be like it's about making money. No, you know it's not about this endless presentation of the zombies, collapse of society, runaway sickness and disease. It is not about money. It's about real people. How many ever few there are left, actually helping to bring this to fruition and to manifest it in some way. They need us to do this shit. I don't believe they can do it alone. If the very minimum they need our consent or permission in the matrix, Neo was needed along with um, Agent Smith to reset the matrix. They were used and played by the Oracle and the architect. They could not, the Oracle and the architect could not do it themselves. This theme repeats over and over again. And that's why these movies are are seemingly endless, this type of movie at this point. Thanks for listening, guys.